Friends, we are glad that you have checked in with us on Facebook and YouTube this morning, uh, for, uh, January 31st. Um, we are meeting just this week. Got a special announcement this week, uh, the next week, February 7th, and then the next week, February the 14th. Those three weeks we will be live streaming. We will not be in person uh, worship. We've had some COVID issues going on with a few people in, within the church. So just trying to take a step back uh, and regroup, and hopefully we're, going, we're shooting for February the 21st to relaunch. Uh, in-person worship so we, you just pray for us in that and we want to encourage you to stay connected uh, on Sunday mornings at 1030 we will be live streaming the Facebook message like we are today uh, so we want to encourage you to check in with that and uh, please do so and stay connected I uh, will encourage you if we had before we uh, this had to stop meeting in person we begin to promote our our Harmony Baptist Pregnancy Center um, love offering as we done each year with a baby bottle drive we're not doing it with the baby bottle so to speak because of COVID issues but we are uh, we have some envelopes here at the church you can come by the office to get some or you can send your, your love offering in the mail as well to give to support our, our Harmony Baptist Pregnancy Center uh, we know this past a couple Sundays ago was, was Sanctity of Human Life Sunday and we are faithful in supporting our Harmony Baptist Pregnancy Center thank the Lord for their work that they do to, to help minister to young families and the young ladies that are pregnant and give them godly counsel and uh, share the love of Jesus with them. So thankful for life and God is pro-life and I know uh, you believe that as well as a church. We believe that and we support that work. So I want to encourage you to give uh, to help out and we're going to be taking up this offering through the month of February as well. So we will be finishing that up once we come back into live person worship, uh, in person worship here at the end of February. So we encourage you about that. Uh, thank you for checking in today. We're going to be in Ephesians this morning. I'm going to open us in prayer. I just want to remind you I've been preaching through the book of Ephesians and we're in chapter 3 so if you'll take your Bible there and find this morning in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 8 through 10 this morning and I'm going to open us in prayer and then we'll get into God's word this morning. Thank you for uh, being here with us in spirit and online and I pray that we would truly worship the Lord today through his word so would you pray with me as we get started in God's word this morning. Father with great joy we come into your presence Lord today in prayer we thank you for uh, the technology we have today to be able to meet together online. Lord, even though we cannot meet in person right now, I pray that, Lord, that you would get us back soon, back in person. I pray that, Lord, all the issues we've had with COVID, uh, people would get well through that. And Lord, you'd guard your people from that uh, virus. And Lord, I pray for any any health issues, sicknesses going on right now. God, that you just raise up your people, strengthen your people, guide your people, Lord, and, and Lord, bless your people today. Lord, as we worship through your word today, I pray that you would speak. Lord, I pray that you would minister through your word today. Thank you for allowing us to worship you now. And God, I pray that you'd be glorified in the preaching of your word. And Lord, I pray that your word would not return into you void today, but let it accomplish what you please. Let it prosper in the thing for which you sent it. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Ephesians chapter 3. You find that in your Bible. We'll read there in just a moment. I'm going to preach on this subject this morning. The gospel of grace and the glory of God. The gospel of grace and the glory of God. You would be hard pressed to find two greater doctrines in all the Bible. There's some that's equal uh, right up there with it, but none greater than those doctrines, which is the gospel of grace and the glory of God. Paul was driven by the grace of God to preach the gospel of Christ that God might be glorified in the world. Uh, throughout our land as you travel from town to town and from city to city on country lanes and interstate highways signs point the way. All types of signs litter the highway. Road signs, warning signs, advertising signs, old signs, new signs, flashing signs, standard signs. Signs are very helpful as we travel. If we are in need of food or gas or lodging, signs Signs are there to let us know what exit to take and or how much further our destination is to make. Because of satellites in the sky and internet on our phone, uh, we can click on that app, our, our, our maps there, and a voice can give us direction. We type in the address we're going to. A voice will give us direction along the way. There are all kinds of helpful signs along the way to help us make it to our destination. Well, the church of Jesus Christ has the message of salvation, and we are to be living testimony 
testimonies of the grace and the mercy of God in the world. We're to be pointing others to Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Christians are to serve others along life's highway to declare the gospel of grace and the glory of God. Paul in this passage declared the message, the mystery, the master, and the mission for the church. Christians are to remember who they were before uh, before Christ, they are to recognize who they are in Christ, and they are to relay the message of Christ, respond in faith to Christ, and rejoice in God for Christ. That's what we are to be doing as believers. So I want to challenge believers today to worship God, to witness for the Lord, and to work together for the glory of the Lord. The gospel of grace and the glory of God. Have you received the gospel of grace? Are you relaying the message to others? Are we living for the glory of God? And are we on mission with God and for God? As individual Christians and as a church, a First Baptist Church, are we on mission with God and for God? Are we useful to Jesus and his kingdom and his work? We're going to get from this passage today some insights into the gospel of grace and the glory of God. And the Bible says, if you'll take your Bible and read with me as we start study this morning. Ephesians 3 verse 8 through 10. You follow along now for this is the word of our great God. Paul wrote to me who am less than the least of all the saints. This grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all see who, uh, what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Father, bless the reading and preaching of your word today. Give us ears to hear what the Holy Spirit says this morning. May we worship you in spirit and in truth. We lift up the name of Jesus today. We pray for the Holy Spirit to minister now through your word, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as we study this passage, I want to point out verse a, first of all, the ministry. There's a personal consideration by Paul. He tells us in verse 8, to me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given. So back up in verse 7, we preached last Sunday about this. Paul reminded the church that it was by the gift of the grace of God that he was a minister. In verse 7, he also recognized and relied on the effective working of God and his power, God's power. Paul was called to to ministry by God and he was supplied by ministry by God. Paul did not think high, highly of himself, but he thought soberly and humbly and with humility. Paul was astounded uh, when he thought of how God saved him and called him and would use him. Any of us ought to be that way. To Paul, he was less than the least of the apostles, uh, of the saints. To Paul, there was none lower than him. He understood that he was a, not a minister because he was worthy to be a minister or be, uh, he was an apostle because of who he was. But in spite of who he was, Paul knew that he was a persecutor of the church. He had arrested Christians. He was on the way to Damascus to persecute and arrest Christians when Jesus arrested him. Paul understood that he was not worthy to be called of God. He also knew though that by the grace of God that he was saved, he was supplied, and he was sent. Paul humbly accepted his calling and he was faithful and diligent and to Jesus and his church and the message that God gave him. Charles Haddon Spurgeon said, They know not the Lord who only desire his service for the honor which it brings. But they have their hearts right before him who want no honor for themselves, but only desire that his name may be extolled above the hills, that he may be made famous. Amen. That was true of the Apostle Paul. Should be true of you and I as well. Paul knew that who he was before he met Jesus. He never forgot about his life before Christ. And he also knew who he was all because of Jesus. Thank God for the grace of God. The gospel of grace that saves us and sets us free and changes us. Romans 12 verse 3. Paul wrote to that church at Rome. He said, For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. 
God's given each one a measure of faith. We're not to think highly of ourselves, but soberly. Then he said to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1.15, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Paul said, I'm the chief of sinners. He thought humbly of himself. He, he recognized the grace of God. Paul didn't magnify Paul. Paul didn't glorify Paul. But he lived to point others to Jesus. Would the church have that same attitude today that every one of us would live to point others to Jesus? Max Anders in his commentary on Ephesians said that Paul considered himself to have no qualifications for the mission God gave him. He ranked last on the list of applicants. God chooses by different criteria than we do. He did not search out Paul's resume to determine if he could do the job. Thank God for that. We're not saved by our qualifications. God gifts, God calls, and God uses. Paul says that this, was, that this was by this grace was given. If we ever forget the grace of God, we're sunk. If we, it is by grace that we're saved, and it is by grace that we serve. The ministry, our service, our help, and our labor is all by the grace of God and should all be done for the glory of God. Paul's personal consideration is a challenge to you and me today. We need to make sure that we have a proper and biblical view of ministry and our personal involvement in it. When we serve Jesus from the right motives, we can be used by Jesus in great ways. I mean, the Apostle Paul was used by Jesus in great ways. This prison epistle, Ephesians, he wrote four, four epistles from prison. God used those epistles down through the ages. Paul is still being used by God, even though he's up in heaven now with God. So the Bible tells us of the ministry, the personal consideration by Paul. I want to move in verse 8 and 9 and talk about the message, uh, the preaching of Christ. And Paul gives us here in verse 8 and 9 the, the preaching of Christ. I want you to notice in verse 8 with me where Paul was to preach. He says there in verse 8 uh, that I should preach among the Gentiles. So Paul considered himself the least of all the saints, but he also knew that Jesus had saved him and called him to preach his glorious gospel. It was a gra grace given to Paul that he should preach among the Gentiles. E.K. Simpson said that while minimizing himself, he magnified his office. Preaching the gospel is the highest calling in the world. I mean, preachers declare the greatest news that the world has ever known and the greatest message that the world needs. Paul said that I should preach. That word preach, we get it, the, the, the Greek word is euangelizo. We get our English word uh, evangelize, evangelism, or evangelist comes from that Greek word. The word means to announce the good news, uh, to evangelize, or to preach the gospel, to declare the gospel. It reminds us that Paul didn't come preaching in Ephesus just to relay information, but he preached the gospel for transformation. Paul was intent on getting the life-changing and soul-saving message to the Gentiles. He was not there just to shout to drowning men about the benefits of life preservers. But he was there to throw a life preserver to drowning men. Any and everywhere Gentiles were at, Paul was to take the message to the Gentiles. To any and all Gentiles, Paul was to preach among the Gentiles. God's message of salvation is for the Jew, and thank God for the Gentile as well. Paul was primarily an apostle to the Gentiles. He was commissioned to preach Christ among the Gentiles. Paul was to evangelize the Gentiles. Thank God for that. I'm telling you, I've said this oftentimes. I've learned that from the Bible. Just like this today, I've been reminded. I don't just preach to relay information to you. I'm preaching for life transformation. We need the Holy Spirit of God to change life, that Jesus saves souls. The Bible tells us where Paul was to preach. Then we notice what Paul was to preach in verse 8. What was, his, what was he to preach? He was to preach amongst the Gentiles. Verse 8 says, the unsearchable riches of Christ. So he states the mission field, the Gentiles, and then he states the message, the unsearchable riches of Christ. That word unsearchable means not tracked out, untraceable, past finding out. 
The word means literally the riches that cannot be tracked. Wow. What a glorious description of the riches of Christ. Words cannot fully describe the riches of Christ. Dictionaries cannot uh, completely depict the depth of the riches of Christ. Paul was to preach the unsearchable, but not preach the unknowable. He's preaching the unknowable. God can and will be made known. God can be known through Jesus Christ the Lord. I mean, the lost can and will be saved when they come to faith in Jesus Christ the Lord and trust in him. They can know God through Christ. But the depth of the riches of Christ can never be completely explored. The width of the riches of Christ can never be crossed over and come to an end. Never. Sam Gordon said, infinite, inexhaustible, incalculable. What is certain about the wealth that Christ has at his disposal is that we shall never come to an end of it. Thank God for that. We can never come to the end of the riches of Christ. Paul had the glorious privilege of declaring and preaching the unsearchable riches of Christ. Preachers today like me and other pastors who are faithful to the word of God, they follow in the steps of the apostle Paul and the truth of Jesus Christ and the riches of knowing him. They're unsearchable. They, we can never track them out, never come to an end of them. Hallelujah. R. Kent Hughes in his commentary on Ephesians said this, the idea is difficult to put into one word, though the translators have attempted tempted with words like inexplorable riches or untraceable, unfathomable, inexhaustible, illimitable, inscrutable, incalculable, and infinite. What are the unsearchable riches? They are saving riches, sanctifying riches, relational riches, practical riches, and eternal riches. What are the implications of this? Primarily that Christ always enriches life. How mistaken the young man was who rejected the gospel saying, don't preach Christ to me, I've got enough problems already. Christ never subtracts from life. He always enriches it with untrackable riches. A corresponding implication for us is that we have a responsibility to share these riches with others. Amen. Have you thought about the riches of the eternal king? You ought, to pray, you ought to praise him this morning. You ought to worship him. You ought to lift up the name of Jesus. Have you come to Jesus in faith? And do you come to Jesus and come after Jesus by faith? You ought to be walking in faith and trusting in him and his wonderful unsearchable riches. A story about another kind of riches, a treasure was told by Alexander Dumas in his story, The Count of Monte Cristo. It was a standing joke among the prisoners in the dungeon of Chateau d'If uh, that the learned Abbey Faria was insane because he claimed to have knowledge of a fabulous hidden treasure. The Abbey befriended Edmond Dantes, a fellow prisoner. Faria educated and adopted him as a son. Dantes carefully avoided the subject of the treasure not wanting to awaken traces of his friend's former madness. But there was no imbalance of mind in the abbey. As he was dying the abbey put the secret of the treasure into Dante's hand. In time Dante's escaped from that terrible prison and found the treasure in an underground grotto. It lay in an oaken coffer bound with steel and closed with a lock and a padlock. Hardly believing his good fortune Dante's pride opened the treasure chest scarcely daring to breathe, lest the secret be a cruel hoax. But it was true. There before him was the wealth of an empire, heaps of golden coins, stacked bars of gold, and an accumulation of diamonds, pearls, and rubies worth the ransom of a dozen kings. The treasure transformed the poor victimized Dantes into the avenging count of Monte Cristo. John Phillips said, We, the children of Adam's ruined race, also have been victimized. We have been born into a sin-cursed world. We are heirs to a fallen nature. We have been born in sin and shaped in iniquity. Our every prospect is blighted by the law of sin and death, but we have in our hands the secret of a hidden treasure, a treasure hidden in Christ. All spiritual wealth is vested in him, and all that limitless wealth is ours. It transformed us when we became Christians from from spiritual paupers into wealthy sons of God. Join heirs with Jesus Christ. Now we can avenge ourselves on the prince of this world
world, on the Lord of darkness, on evil spirits that rule the high places. We can use our ne newfound resources to live godly lives in Christ Jesus and introduce others to all that God has for those who believe in him. One thing is sure, John Phillips said, we can never find that wealth apart from Christ. It is untrackable. Science, psychology, politics, social reform, education, or culture cannot lead us to that treasure. The spiritual treasure we need is found in Christ and in him alone. End of quote. I mean, Paul was called by God and commissioned by God to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. So let us rejoice, church, today in the God of our salvation and the gospel of grace and depend totally on the King to meet all our needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 19. The Bible tells us where Paul was to preach, what Paul was to preach. Then we also notice why Paul was to preach. Verse 9, he tells us why Paul was to preach. The Bible says, verse 9, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Make all see. So the purpose of Paul's preaching was to evangelize the Gentiles and reveal to them the great mystery of Christ and his church to the Gentiles. Now the message of the gospel is not limited in scope. The message is for everyone. All people have sinned against God. All people have fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the message is to the world. Jesus Jesus died on the cross for the world. All people are blinded by sin and the God of this age, the little g. Uh, their minds are carnal and corrupt and taken captive. Paul was to preach that the blinders would be lifted, uh, that the mind would be enlightened, uh, that the will would be submissive and surrender to Christ, and that the sinner would be saved and forgiven of all their sins uh, through the blood of Jesus that was shed on Calvary's cross. That's the church's message. We are to preach to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Lehman Strauss said the church's commission is to all the world and to every creature in order that all might be enlightened as to God's purpose in the mystery, namely the calling out from among the Gentiles of people for his name. God's plan is to give light to all the world through the worldwide distribution of the gospel. This Paul saw clearly. We conclude this then the evangelization of the world formed a part of God's plan when he created the universe. It was in the heart of God, in the mind of God. All people are in need of seeing what is the fellowship of the mystery in the gospel because all people have been blinded by sin. John Newton was a slave trader uh, that was gloriously captured and saved by the grace of God. He wrote one of our most famous hymns. We sing it so often in the church. It's entitled Amazing Grace. In that song, John Newton wrote these words, I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. He was blind, but now he sees. I was blind. If you've been saved today, you see now, but there's been a time that you were blinded. You were blinded. We've all been blinded. The world's blinded today to the truth of the gospel. That's why we need to get the message out. Paul preached to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery. David Jeremiah said the church is to be a living testimony of the work of God in man, a place where mercy and grace flow freely for all to see. Instead of acting like we've got it all together, we should acknowledge that we are nothing without the grace of God, that we are just pilgrims on our way. How will they believe God can work in their broken lives if they don't see him working in ours? The church is to be God's primary visual aid to the world by which they discover that the door to the riches of God's mercy is standing wide open by his grace. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Our message has not changed. It is the same message that Paul preached. Our mission has not changed. It is the same mission that Paul embarked upon. We are to be on the same message, preaching that all might see. Greg Zanus is a carpenter from Aurora, Illinois, whose father-in-law taught him the trade in carpentry. In the process, the two became best friends. In 1996, Greg's father-in-law was robbed by two men and murdered. In an attempt to express his deep grief and personal sense of loss, Greg built an eight-foot cross 
and planted it at the scene of the crime. From that act, his ministry, Crosses for Losses, was born. Greg began building eight-foot wooden crosses and erecting them at the scenes of fatal crimes or accidents. The crosses are made of natural wood with the knot holes and wood grain showing. Greg said the lumber looks like the type of cross that Jesus would have been crucified on, a rough cross. He constructed the crosses standing in honor of the victims of the Columbine High shooting in Colorado. He received a lot of invitations to take those Columbine crosses to youth rallies and and gatherings all across the nation. Where, he said, wherever I go, the crosses are reaching kids. They are crying and coming to the Lord. In some places, they come down by the hundreds to accept the Lord. Greg estimates he has made more than 3,000 crosses, personally delivering over 2,000, covering practically every state in the United States. Well, our, mercy, our message is the unsearchable riches of Christ. Our mission is to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery. That word fellowship is the Greek word koinonia. The word means partnership, participation with, uh, communion with. It's not just something we do around a table. It's something we share. And so we just share as believers. We share in Jesus Christ our Lord. We share in the Holy Spirit of God who has sealed us. We share in the witness and the worship and the work of God. We got so many things in common as believers. We are to fellowship in Christ and the work of God and the worship of God uh, and get the gospel of grace out and the, to the glory of God. Fellowship. Believers fellowship, share in, participate in the mystery of the Christ and his church. Paul will further expound on the mystery here in verse 9 and 10. So we've noted this morning the ministry, Paul's personal consideration. Then I preached a few minutes about the message, the preaching of Christ. He was to preach Christ among the Gentiles. Thirdly, don't you notice in verse 9 and 10 with me, with your Bible open, notice with me the mystery. In the past it was concealed. In verse 9 he tells us it was concealed there in the past. Uh, look what it says in verse 9. Uh, which from the beginning of the ages. So Paul tells us when it was concealed. It, which was from the beginning. So the mystery was not revealed in past ages. But it was concealed from past ages. God's timing to unveil and to reveal and uncover the mystery of salvation for both Jews and Gentiles. Was not, in, not unveiled until in past ages. So, but from the beginning of the ages. From the inception of time and creation of the world and creation of Adam and Eve and the development of the nation and his chosen Old Testament people. God had not yet revealed his ultimate plan of redemption. This also reminds us again that salvation in Christ and the mystery of the church is not God's plan B uh, or something God came up with in response to, to the fall of man and the sin. They didn't, God didn't have to scramble. He didn't have to figure out something else to, ha to do. No, it was in the heart of God and the mind of God forever. In, in the begin from the beginning of the ages, the mystery was in the heart of God and the mind of God always, even from the beginning of the ages. God's plans for the Jews and the Gentiles and the world were in effect from the beginning of the ages. This also magnifies the sovereignty of God and the power of God and the immutability of God. His plans are worked out and they come to fruition in heaven and on earth as time passes. God's purposes do not change and his ultimate will is never thwarted. Now, you and I often make plans and work at making our plans work, don't we? We try to make plans, we try to make our plans work, but the best laid plans of man often are frustrated and the details of our plans are often out of our control. There's so much depending on so much out of our control in our plans. This got to work out so that this can work, hoping that we can get this this happen. Uh, so we make plans to go to a certain place, to do a certain thing, to spend time with family, or go on a vacation, to attend a sporting event, or go to a play, to have a date night with our spouse, and, and the list goes on and on. We make plans. Our plans can come to pass and do work out at times as they have been planned. But that is not always the case. Life happens, and circumstances change, and people and jobs are unreliable, and plans often fall through. Have you ever had a plan fall through? I mean, we're in the midst of changing right now in the midst of this church. I, I'd, I'd love to be meeting with you on Sunday morning right here in person. But we have to sometimes roll with the flow. 
but not so with the Lord. He is sovereign and his plan of salvation through Christ and the mystery of the church was in effect from the beginning of the ages. The Bible tells us that the mystery was concealed in the past. We learn when it was concealed. Notice where it was concealed. Verse 9, Paul tells us where this mystery was concealed. It was concealed, notice with me, in the Creator. The Bible says, has been hidden in God who created all things. So the mystery of Christ and the church has been hidden in God. That means that the mystery was not deposited in a bank. It was not displayed in a museum. It was not locked in a vault. It was not kept in the clouds. It was not guarded by angels in heaven. It was not hidden behind a veil in a temple. The mystery was hidden in God, and what was hidden in God cannot be searched out by man or obtained by man or angels. They can't figure it out and get to it. It had to be uncovered and unveiled and revealed by God because it was hidden in God. Paul reminds the church of the Lord God as creator. The mystery was hidden in the all-powerful, all-knowing, everywhere present God. The mystery was hidden in God. The Bible says there in verse 9, who created all things. So the one who was before all things and reigns over all things and is the creator of all things is the one where the mystery originated and was in safekeeping. It was... The mystery was concealed in the Creator. Then Paul also tells us the mystery was concealed through Christ, who created all things through Jesus Christ. Paul magnifies the truth of God who created all things, and here he further elaborates on the God who created all things. It is through Jesus Christ that God made all things. Now we know God as the Creator, and we know God the Creator is Jesus Christ. God made all things through Jesus. Hey, wait a minute, God created the heavens and earth. Amen. And Jesus created all things. So what does that mean? That means Jesus is God. Amen. He's the creator. He made all things. It is Jesus Christ the Lord that made the heavens and the earth. Paul told that to the Colossians as well. Colossians 1 verse 15 and 16. If you're taking notes, I'll read that and you can go back and research it. Speaking of Jesus, Paul wrote this. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether the thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. Jesus made it all. It's for him. It's for his glory. And all things are made by him. All things are going to be accountable one day to him. Paul made a glorious declaration about the mystery of Christ that was hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ. The mystery was hidden from the beginning of the ages in God who created all things through Jesus Christ. Now creation. I'm going to stop talking about that because we live in a, such a secular, uh, atheistic, uh, ungodly world that denies creation. We got in our schools today. We've been ingrained in it's affected every family in America, in the world today about this, this evolution, which is such a false doctrine. You see, creation testifies that, that there's a creator. You go out and look at the creation. There is a creator. Creation testifies. There's a creation just like this building I'm in right now. This building testifies there were, was a builder. Now, I pastor some old people here. I know I do. I got young people, middle-aged people. I got old people here. But this building was built in 1902, and I don't pastor anybody that was alive in 1902. 1902, that's, that's 119 years ago. Nobody that I, that I know of that I'm pastoring is 119 years old. So, but I, I know this, being in this building today, there was a testimony, even though I didn't know those people, nobody in this place knew those builders personally. There was builders. That, that, there was architects who drew up the plan. There was men, men that, that, that nailed the boards together, that framed this church, that put up, that run the electrical, that put up the sheetrock, that put on the roof. There, there was a builder and the building is a testimony there's a builder even though we don't get to know the builder and don't know him because we didn't live back then we know that the building testifies there's a building you got a painting in your house we got paintings here in the church those paintings testify that there's a painter Th those colors just didn't come up on that canvas it had to be intelligent design somebody had to take the right colors and paint in the heart what was in that painter and put on that canvas that picture 
The painting now testifies there was a painter. That thing just didn't, colors just didn't explode and all of a sudden there's a picture. That's what the evolutionists and those false teachers want to tell you that happened. No sir, no ma'am, God created everything. You and I have been made in the image of God. God made the heavens, the skies, the mountains, the trees, the oceans, everything that we see. The Bible also tells us everything that we don't see. Jesus made those things that are visible and those things that are invisible. So creation testifies there's a creator. But listen to me now. Creation does not testify about the mystery of, of the church in Christ. The mystery was hidden in God through Jesus Christ who made all things. So the mystery was concealed in the past. But I got good news for you. Let's move down to verse 10. Let's keep reading. Look in verse 10. Not only was the mystery concealed in the past, but it was revealed in the present. Verse 10 tells us what is revealed. He says, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known. So Paul reveals the reason and purpose uh, that the mystery was hidden in God from the beginning of the ages. It was with the intent to make known the gospel of grace and the glory of God that the mystery and the church has been revealed. The wisdom of God is on display in the revelation of the mystery of Christ in his church. The Gentiles are saved by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ, just like the Jews are. The two are made one in Christ and brought into one body, the body of Christ. It is the manifold wisdom of God that is shown in present generations. That word manifold, the Greek word means many colored or multifaceted. It's like looking at a light shining through a diamond that gives out different colors through that diamond. And it's every sided. God's color, wonderful color, and his wisdom is all around. It's shown through, through, uh, through uh, the, the mystery of the gospel of Jesus Christ that it might be made known to those. I don't know if you remember in history class or in college uh, re learning about the Rosetta Stone. What was the Rosetta Stone? Well, the Rosetta Stone was a tablet that was discovered and allowed archaeologists to translate ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics into modern-day languages. Without the discovery of the Rosetta Stone, all the ancient history and wisdom of Egypt would have remained a mystery forever. Can you imagine what our record of ancient civilizations would be? be like without the records of one of the greatest civilizations on on the earth during that time of Egypt. Just think of how much we'd be missing out without the help of the Rosetta Stone to translate that ancient unknown language. Have you ever tried to learn a foreign language? Pretty tough when you're not used to hearing the, the, the sounds are strange. Pretty tough. But if you've learned a foreign language, it's because you had a textbook or a teacher or maybe you had a software program. Like me, I've got an app on my computer. It's called Duolingo. I'm learning German right now. I've been learning over a year, year and a half. I've been trying to learn some German. It's, it's hard. It's tough. It's hard to learn a, a language that you hadn't never learned or heard much of. What if you didn't have those things, a teacher or a textbook or an app to help you out? What if you were trying to learn a language that no one else in the world spoke? It wouldn't just be hard to learn, it would be impossible to learn. But guess what? Apart from Jesus Christ coming into the world, we can never understand God's plan. Uh, without Jesus, we cannot decode the translation of God's mysterious plan for redeeming our souls. Without Jesus, we can't, uh, can't even hope to speak of God's language of salvation. Without Jesus, the riches of experiencing God and knowing his heart are forever sealed away from us. The manifold and multifaceted wisdom of God is made known, though, uh, through the message of the gospel, the will of God, the work of God, and the salvation of God has been made known. Hallelujah! We can receive God's communication and receive God's salvation all because of Jesus. The Bible tells us what is revealed. Then notice lastly by whom it is revealed. Paul says in verse 10, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church. It may be made known by the church. 
It is made known to the church. Amen. If you've been saved, the mystery of the gospel of grace has been made known to you. You've received it. But we learn also we have a responsibility in that as the church. The church is made up of born again believers in Jesus Christ who have received the message of the mystery of Christ. And we are also to relay that message of the mystery of Christ to others. Christians are those who have gotten the message and Christians are those who give out the message. The church has the responsibility to preach Jesus and make known the mystery of the manifold wisdom of God in the gospel of grace. In his book, God's New Society, R. Kent, excuse me, John R. Stott, John R. Stott, in God's New Society, John R. Stott wrote this. Secular history, history concentrates its attention on kings, queens, and presidents, on politicians and generals, in fact, on VIPs. The Bible concentrates rather on a group it calls the saints. Often little people, insignificant people, unimportant people, who are, however, at the same time, God's people, and for that reason are both unknown to the world World, and yet well known to God. Secular history concentrates on wars, battles, and peace treaties, followed by yet more wars, battles, and peace treaties. The Bible concentrates rather on the war between good and evil, on the decisive victory won by Jesus Christ over the powers of darkness, on the peace treaty ratified by his blood, and on the sovereign proclamation of, of an amnesty for, for all rebels who will repent and believe. Again, secular history concentrates on the changing map of the world as one nation defeats another and annexes its territory and on the rise and fall of empires. The Bible concentrates rather on a multinational community called the church which has no territorial frontiers uh, which claims nothing less than the whole world for Christ and whose empire will never come to an end. End of quote. Hallelujah. The church. It's our, God's blessed. God blessed the church and God has commissioned the church. We have a responsibility to get the gospel out. God has raised up the church and entrusted the church with the gospel of grace and the glory of God. It is the church that declares that Jesus saves and it is the church that brings glory to God. It is by the church that has received the message that the message is made known to the world. Paul was sent to preach to the Gentiles amongst whom the Ephesians were amongst their number. And it is the church that has the responsibility and privilege to declare the gospel of grace and the glory of God. Let me ask you, are you doing your part to declare the gospel of grace in the world? Are we giving and going? Are we sharing and sowing? Are we faithful in our worship and our work and our witness for the Lord? Have we believed the message and received the message of salvation? Have you been transformed by the Lord Jesus and saved by his grace? Rabbi Chil Slostowski immigrated from Poland to Israel and became a professor at a seminary in Tel Aviv. He had a deep hatred toward the Lord Jesus Christ. So great was his resentment that he sharply criticized a young student who was reading the Hebrew New Testament. The young man replied by giving him the copy of the New Testament. That night the rabbi alone in his room stayed up until 3 o'clock in the morning reading about the Nazarene who claimed to be the Messiah. The Holy Spirit guided him, him into all truth and later he confessed. He said, I have already found more than 200 passages of the New Testament that prove beyond a doubt that Jesus is truly the Messiah. Rabbi Shlostowski later confessed, At first I was no more than a secret believer. In my inward being I knew that Yeshua was the Messiah of Israel and my personal Redeemer. But I continued nonetheless to fulfill my task and duties as a rabbi. Two months I lived like this. At last I realized that I could no longer live a double life. I had to confess the Messiah openly, publicly, whatever the consequences might be. End of quote. The one trustworthy message we must all hold firmly to is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who came to be our personal Redeemer. Would you trust the Lord Jesus Christ today and be saved? Hear the message of the gospel of the grace of God. Believe the mystery.
that God has uncovered and revealed to our generation. God has uncovered it and revealed it to us. Christ came to save the lost and to reconcile sinners to God. Jesus died on the cross for my sin, for your sin, for the world's sin. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. And on the third day, God raised him from the dead, and he lives forevermore. And he calls on all in the world to trust in him, to be saved, to be forgiven, to be cleansed of all your sin, to be given eternal life by him. Would you trust in Jesus today? If you've never trusted Jesus, God's spoken to your heart through this message this morning. Your greatest need is not religion. Your greatest need is not reform. Your greatest need is redemption. You need to be saved. Trust Jesus today. Trust in him. Call on him in faith today. Like that rabbi who read the New Testament, Hebrew New Testament, came to know Jesus as his Messiah. Jesus is the only Messiah. He's the only way to heaven. He took our punishment on Calvary's cross 2,000 years ago. God sent him into the world. He was born of the Virgin Mary. He lived a sinless life. And when he went to the cross, he suffered not for his sin. He had no sin. He suffered for my sin and your sin so we could be forgiven. And the Bible says if you'll call upon the name of the Lord, if you'll trust in Jesus, if you'll confess him with your mouth, that if you confess the Lord Jesus with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And the Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Call on him right there where you are today, watching on live stream. You can call on him like this. This prayer won't save you, but it's your faith in Jesus. Your, Jesus will save you through faith, and it's by his grace. I preach the gospel of grace today, so you just need to believe and let the Holy Spirit remove those blinders from your eyes and from your heart that you might be saved. Receive the King today. Receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior today. Call on him like this. Dear Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. And I know my sin has separated me from you. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. To cleanse my heart and save my soul. I repent today, Lord. I turn to you from my sin. And I ask you to forgive me and give me eternal life. And today, by faith, I receive you. And I trust you. And I will confess you publicly. And I will live for you proudly and faithfully. And I thank you for saving my soul. If you prayed and trusted Jesus today, would you let us know that? You can contact the church office. Uh, you call us, 352-472-2351. We'd love to hear of your decision. We can get some material in your hands. You can visit our church website, newberryfirst.net. You can tr uh, you can go, go to the website and trust uh, that find the information there on how to uh, get in contact with us as well. We'd love to give you information on your beginning steps on how you can follow Jesus. Church, I want to say this to you today. As you, you have followed Jesus and you've trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior today, I want to encourage you today, right where you are, be thankful, be grateful, and be faithful to the Lord Jesus for who He is and for what He has done for us. There's none that has, has done any greater thing for us than Jesus, and He continues to sustain us and call us and use us. Let's be faithful to Him. Let's return. Let's be set out in our hearts. We're going to be back in worship on the 21st together. God tells us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. We're in a trying times, and we have stepped back for just for a few weeks. This is not our. This is temporary, not permanent. And Lord willing, we're going to be back February 21st. I want to encourage you to make plans to be back with us, and let's bring our worship of our Lord together and celebrate together. Let's live for the glory of God. And let's be faithful to share the gospel of grace with others. Father, thank you for your church today. I pray that you'd strengthen our faith as we've heard your word today. And Lord, I pray that you would stir our hearts, revive our souls, Lord, that we might be active in sharing the gospel of grace and living for the glory of God. Thank you that, Lord, that we learn from Paul to, to have a humble view of ourselves, knowing, Lord, that we're not worthy, but you are. And it's all by your grace that we're saved, that we're supplied, and that we're sent to serve you. Lord, it's by grace that we're saved. It's by grace that we serve. And I pray that you would raise up saints of God that have that attitude that we 
will serve by the grace of God. Lord bless the First Baptist Church. Grow your church. Guide your people. We thank you for the opportunity we had today to worship you. And let us worship you every day in spirit and in truth. Let us stay connected. Let us stay encouraged and, and stay encouraging one another and use our gifts for your glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to encourage you to check back with us next Sunday. We do not have Wednesday night services right now. Our youth are not meeting until until February the 17th. Uh, that Wednesday night we're going to have in-person prayer meeting that night on the 17th, that Wednesday night. Then Sunday the 21st we're going to come back together as a church. That's the plan. So next Sunday, February 7th, we will meet again. On We'll launch this at 10.30 a.m. You can worship with us on Sunday, uh, February 7th, 10.30 a.m. Then February 14th again. We'll be back as well at 10.30 on our live stream on YouTube and our Facebook as well. So thank God for that technology. Thank you for checking in. Share this message with others, family members, and go, go on and share it with it and get, get God's word out. And let's be, continue to pray for one another. Pray for me as I try to lead the church and love God's people. And yeah, let's pray for one another as well that God will keep us in the center of his will. I love you. Have a good week. As I often say and before we leave and dismissed, say a good word about our Lord Jesus and say a good word about his church. Have a great day. Amen.